Hi, Misha here, and uh, we're moving along with Japanese battleships. And when people think of powerful Japanese battleships, especially with the word most in front of them, they usually think of this, the Yamato class. This is actually Mushashi, but uh, it's actually not what we're going to talk about in this video. Rather, we're going to talk about the Nagato class. Because for a long time, these two ships, I only have a model of one, were the most powerful battleships in the Japanese Navy, and arguably, for a while, in the whole world. <clears throat> these were the last battleships started during World War I in Japan, and would be their absolutely best ones until Yamato's came along in very late 41 and 42. And this dates back to the Russo-Japanese War, as so much of everything does. After that war, the Japanese Navy wanted the 8-8 fleet, where they had 8 battleships and 8 battle cruisers. And they had first started with the Congos for the f for four battle cruisers, and then they had the Fuso, which evolved into the Issei class to have four battleships. So by 1915 or so, they were halfway to their goal. Funding was tight, so they were just hoping maybe to get four more battleships, four more dreadnoughts or super dreadnoughts. But the Japanese government, the Diet only authorized one of these in 1916 and that would ultimately become Nagato but then the US who you know keep in mind in 1916 wasn't in the war yet started some saber rattling and President Wilson along with congressional support promised the US would build 10 new battleships and six battle cruisers and the U.S. was Japan's A number one adversary at this time. I mean, not openly, but uh, they were, had good relations with Britain. Russia was no longer a threat, so the U.S. was the most dominant power that could threaten them. Now, of course, the U.S. fleet would be split between the Pacific and the Atlantic. Still yet, that meant a lot of new American warships in the Pacific. So, the following year, the Diet would authorize fundage for three more dreadnoughts, battleships, and one of these would evolve into Mutsu or Mutsu that you see here. So construction was underway in 1917 and 1918. However, neither ship was done when World War I ended, and coming into 1919-1920, a naval arms race was ramping up between the US, UK, and Japan, and I'm sure France would like to think they were involved in it, and they weren't. The problem is, all these nations, especially the UK, were really financially strapped after World War I, and did need to be spending money on military ships. You know, that's why most of the hoods were cancelled, or excuse me, admiral classes, except for hood. So, in the summer of 1921, a Washington Naval Conference was announced and members were invited and they would start meeting in November of that year. And the idea was to put limitations to halt this race, to have a holiday on the building of battleships so these countries could focus on more peace-oriented pursuits. So every country, of course, wanted something and had to give up something. The UK scrapped several designs, including the G3s and the N3s. America was working on the Colorado classes. And Japan had very recently launched Mutsu, but she wasn't completely done fitting out, although she was officially commissioned. So... They, the U.S. and U.K. wanted Japan to give up Mutsu to scrap her because the idea was any ships that were still being built or fitted out 
were to be scrapped. And Japan vehemently was against this. It nearly became a uh, sticking point. Incidentally, in 1917, Japanese designers actually proposed changing Mutsu quite a bit before she was really that far along in, in construction, integrating more lessons from the Battle of Jutland. And this was debated, but ultimately decided not to do, because it would delay her construction quite a bit. It would have made a better ship, but in the end it's, it's actually very good they didn't, because Mutsu would not have been commissioned in 1921 if they had redesigned her. So, good call there. So Japan wasn't going to give her up, so what could they do? Well, they had to give something else. Ultimately, this led to the UK being able to build the two ships of the Nelson class. And the US was able to complete several of the Colorado. Not the full line that they were planning, but several. And so Japan was a signator to the Washington Naval Treaty which put limitations on things, 35 tonnage, 35,000 tons or less, guns no greater than 16 inches, you know the drill. And of course there was a quote-unquote holiday on building battleships until at least 1930, which would later be extended by the London Treaty, but that's in the future. So everyone would sign. One thing Japan did have to give up, to keep Mutsu, she gave up one or two older, kind of first generation dreadnoughts, like Satsuma. So, yeah, it was a give and take, but the intentions were good, although the outcome was a little less optimistic. Well, with all that fighting to keep Nagato in Mutsu, what did Japan end up adding to her battle fleet? Nagato and Mutsu were just under 33,000 tons standard, so light, and up to 39,000 tons fully loaded. They were over 700 feet long, with a crew originally of over 1,300. They had quite a bit of effort put into the underwater protection, the armor, especially against torpedoes. And unlike earlier Japanese battleships that had the pretty much continuous or evenly spread armor system, British style, they were the first ones to have the all or nothing style, the American style. But the big thing with these were their guns. These were the first battleships to launch to be commissioned in the world with guns over 15 inches. They had eight 16.1 inch guns and Four turrets, both front and rear super firing. And they had up to 25 and a half inch guns for the secondary battery. And originally they had four anti-aircraft guns, and of course this would be increased as time went on. We know the deal. They also had four torpedo tubes. And they were quite fast originally, at 26 and a half knots on trials. Not bad at all for a full battleship in the 1920s. Of course, throughout their career, they would be updated. For example, in 1926, they would remove some of the torpedo tubes and ins install some more AA guns. Then in the 30s, they would be totally rebuilt and updated as best they could. Installing more equipment, changing the superstructure. They would also remove the remaining torpedo tubes. And then just before World War II, they would start getting the wonderful 25mm anti-aircraft guns stuck on board, both of them. So very impressive battleships in 1920. And still, very threatening in 1940. Keep in mind, Britain only had the Nelsons with 16-inch guns. The rest of theirs were 15-inch or even 14. 
and America well they had some 16 inch warships they also had plenty of smaller guns so these were very much a threat and were really the only two modern battleships that Japan had in their navy when war began in 1941. The Fuso and the Iseis, where they had been modernized, were at least semi-obsolescent. Just a couple of years in technology make a big difference. So, what about Nagato and Mutsu's service? With all that Japan did to fight to have them, were they actually useful? Since this model is of Mutsu, let's start with her. In fact, this one is circa 1923, so this was her original configuration. Yeah, Mutsu was commissioned in October of 1921, so really right before the uh, Washington Naval Conference kicked off, which I'm sure wasn't coincidental. It definitely gave Japan a better bargaining position. One of the first things she actually did in active service in 1923 was to take supplies on board to help victims and refugees from the Great Kanto Earthquake. Nagato would also serve there along with several other ships. Then the following year she would uh, use the old ship uh, Satsuma for target practice again along with Nagato because it had to be sunk because of the naval treaty. She would go in for minor refits and updates throughout the 1920s. And then in uh, 1927, she would actually be chosen by Hirohito as his flagship during a naval review procession. And he would again bestow this honor on Mutsu in 1933. And uh, that's really it. Uh, again, she went in for a rebuild in the 1930s, came back out, and was made ready for war in 1941. And while her sister was hanging out at Pearl Harbor, she was made ready to support the Guadalcanal campaign. She was transferred to Truk, and then would launch in August to support the efforts. And then on August 27th, she would take part in the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, which was the first time she fired her guns in anger, and as it happened, the last time. Yeah, so did some fighting there, supported actions during the Guadalcanal campaign, and then of course Japan would immediately, you know, eventually withdraw. So she would be back to Japan by January of 1943, and during that spring she would uh, go under standard maintenance and training operations. And that's really it, because, unfortunately, on June 8th, her third turret would explode, specifically the magazine. And no one knows exactly what happened, even to this day. Some report smoke was spotted coming out of number three turret before, but what is known, the magazine ignited while she was safely in... Port. In fact, she even had visitors on board. It split the ship in half. The front half sunk pretty much immediately. But quite interestingly, the rear floated for several hours during the night. Because this happened right around midnight and she was still floating around dawn. That was good in a way because at least it let them rescue some people. I mean, she had a quite large crew at this time of nearly 1,400 of those, around 350 were rescued, but it's still a tragic loss, no matter how you look at it. And uh, in 1943, June, Japan's fortunes were not going well, and this is still one of her prized battleships. So, the government decides to classify her loss as a state secret. They managed to cover it up, basically. So, I don't know, were there Japanese truthers in 1944 talking about Mutsu? I don't know. This, the way they dealt with the surviving 
crew members, they basically just split them up into small groups or even individuals and assign them to all kinds of faraway garrisons throughout the Pacific. So even if they told tales, they wouldn't have anyone to back up their story. But most of them probably didn't want to talk about it. I mean, it was horrific. And they were told not to by their emperor, so most would have been obedient. Even before the wreck could have been looked at, a commission was already established to figure out what happened, and they'd already decided that they were going to just say that a saboteur, a disgruntled member of the Japanese Navy, essentially lit the magazine on fire and blew the ship up along with himself. No one knows, though, that that was just a reason given to mollify the powers that be. Who knows? Could have been a lot of things, but... It was very sudden, and uh, any time over a thousand people lose their lives, even if they are the enemies, they're mostly just sailors doing their job, so, no, yeah. But yeah, America didn't even know she was lost for quite some time, because it was successfully covered up. And that was the end of Mutsu. She only really was used in one engagement, at least one of any note, and had no real anythings to her credit. So, yeah, they fought to have her, and in the end, she was pretty unremarkable. But then again, a lot of battleships had that fate in World War II. So what about Nagato herself? I really wish I had a model of Nagato. It's very strange to me that Eagle Moss hasn't done one. Now, I say that, there is a chance. I have a complete list of the collection, except for number three which was ostensibly never imported to the USA. I wonder if number three was Nagato. If anyone from Japan especially knows, please let me know. And if anyone from Japan has two of them, please let me know. It just seems odd because they have all the other battleships. In fact, they do both Yamato and Musashi, as well as quite a few of the lesser-known ships. Anyway, I digress. Nagato was commissioned 11 months before Matsu, in November 1920, and she was pretty much always a flagship when she went into service. To that end, one of her first duties was more for state events, which is common for battleships of the time. Hood did much the same thing. In 1922, England's Prince of Wales, the, the man, not the ship, visited Japan, and during that time, Nagato hosted him. In my notes, it's kind of funny. Instead of Prince of Wales, there was Prince of Ale, which um, I, I, that would be an awesome title for the, the Crown Prince, the Prince of Ale. Anyway, like uh, Mutsu in 1923, she helped take care of the survivors of the Kanto earthquake, and in 1924, she helped sink Satsuma with gunnery practice. And then at the end of 1925, she was named the flagship of the combined fleet of the Japanese Navy. And from that point on, she would be in and out of reserve and in and out of uh, refits. And she was rebuilt in the mid-1930s. And they did a pretty extensive job. For example, her standard weight went from little under 33,000 tons up to over 39,000 tons and she could displace as much as nearly 47,000 tons by World War II. They gave the both ships new turrets taken from the from my canceled Japanese class the, the Toso. These turrets had better elevation and better armor so more range more protection they also gave them new armor penetrating shells. They gave additional torpedo bulges. And they lengthened the ships from just under 710 feet to just under 740 feet. And the crew would rise first to nearly 1400 and then by World War II would be over 1700. They would also remove all of the torpedo tubes. And, uh, yeah, 
they install a new Bakoda mast structure getting rid of the original seven sided structure like on this model and the only real downside to the more protection the top speed dropped from 26 and a half knots to 25 knots which is relatively slow by the standards of the day but still not insultingly so oh and they also started having a catapult on board and carrying two or three reconnaissance planes so yeah by 1941 they were made ready for war oh I should I guess mention that they did participate in a secondary role during the Sino Japanese War in 1937 they did deliver troops to Shanghai both Mutsu and Nagato so that was one action they took part in um, you know, early after the refit and then in late 1937 Nagato was made a training ship and then just over a year later at the end of 38 she was again assigned to be the flagship of the combined fleet a position that she held in 1941 when on December 2nd Admiral Yamamoto gave the order to set sail for the attack on Pearl Harbor. During the attack itself on December 7, she of course was a command post for Admiral Yamamoto and was there to provide distant coverage in case things went wrong, but really for the Japanese nothing did. But then in February of 1942, Yamamoto would transfer his flag to the newly commissioned Yamato, making that his new flagship. Thus, Nagato was no longer at the tip of the spear, as it were, after nearly 20 years. To that end, she would uh, kind of be detached for various other duties. After several uneventful patrols and escort missions, in June she was part of the main force at the Battle of Midway. That would be alongside Yamoto. Afterwards, she would... Uh, continue to just kind of hang out. I don't know what to say. She didn't really do a whole lot at the end of 1942, mostly hanging around home waters. She would uh, receive her first radar in May of 43. It was an air search radar set. And then after the loss of Mutsu, she would be transferred to truck that August and from there, she would sortie out various times, looking to engage American carriers and hopefully sink them to no avail. Uh, yeah, she just had no luck. So moving into 44, she's really not had much action. She was uh, just kind of there. <laughs> and she would uh, leave truck in February because there was early warning of a Allied air raid and she would kinda sail towards Singapore and operate in that general area for a few months and then she would be called in for the Battle of the Philippine Sea where she would escort some carriers. Um, this time she would have minor combat firing her secondary and anti-aircraft guns at Allied Naval bombers. She had some minor damage, but nothing really significant. And after that, she was recalled to Japan. She would get there on the 27th, and she would get some surface search radars this time, plus more anti aircraft guns. And then, like most ships in the Japanese Navy, she was ordered to support the Philippines in October. And on her way to what would become the Battle of Leyte Gulf on the 24th, she was attacked and hit by a couple of bombs. Some crew were killed, some injured. 
But the damage was quite moderate to light, so much so that she continued on, and the next day she would engage what we know today as the American group of Taffy 3, of escort carriers, destroyers. Very interesting history there. And this would actually be the first time she would fire her main 16 inch guns in anger in combat. But she would not hit any of the members of Taffy 3. On the other hand, she would mostly avoid damage. Later on in the battle, she would actually shell a cruiser and do some damage to it and take some damage herself. She would avoid various torpedoes but be hit by a few more bombs. But nothing terribly significant. She would avoid several bomb raids in November and then be ordered back to Japan to repair her numerous small scrapes and scratches and, and holes that had been acquired over several days of fighting. Obviously, they take off did not go well for Japan. They lost a lot of ships, including Musashi here. Many others were damaged. Many more were damaged in November. Japan was pretty much on full-on retreat. So by the time that Nagato got back to Japanese port, they, they really just didn't know what to do with her. They didn't really have the manpower and resources and time to fix her. And they didn't have the fuel to, well, fuel her, because it's a huge battleship. Again, we're nearly at 47,000 tons full displacement now. So, the decision was made to turn her into a floating anti-aircraft battery. To that end, they remove her main funnel, they remove her main mast. They eventually even cart off four of her eight 16-inch guns to mount them on the shore. And uh, in April of 1945 she's reduced to the reserve fleet which means they pretty much take most of her other armaments off many of the recently installed anti-aircraft cannons come off her secondary five and a half inch guns come off she's basically stripped down to being a hulk but still there still has a crew on board still just kind of floating doing the anti-aircraft thing unfortunately that was with those 25 millimeter guns so pretty ineffective. And then on July 18 she is caught in another allied air attack, air raid and really not able to escape and most of her stuff's gone so she's damaged. And then on August 30th 1945 US sailors take control of Nagato. So she was one of the Japanese warships that actually survived World War II and I'd have to check, but maybe the most, uh, the largest, the most important. But she was in a really pitiful shape, and the, the Americans studied her, and she, you know, through the damage, through mistreatment, through neglect, through the Japan, Japanese losing the war, she was in pretty bad shape in late 1945. To that end, since she wasn't really deemed as salvageable or worth anything, in April of 46, she was selected for Operation Crossroads. These were nuclear bomb tests off of Bikini Atoll to be conducted in June and July that summer. And Nagato actually survived the first bomb test, which was an aerial detonation. But to be fair, she was pretty far away from it. For the second detonation, which was an underwater test, she was closer, which caused a tsunami, a tidal wave, and she was rocked pretty good by this. And at first she was kind of bobbing around, seeming okay, but no one could really check because, well, by this point she literally was glowing in the dark and radioactive as hell. So there wasn't much they could do as she started to take on more and more of a list and then she eventually sank early in the morning of July 30th, capsizing and going under. Interestingly, another ship that was there used for testing was uh, Prince Eugen of Germany, which was given to America as a war prize at the end of World War II. 
and, uh, and kind of fun. Nagato today is a popular diving site for scuba guys. In 1996, it was declared safe to dive on, at least as safe as any old trip could be. At least it wasn't glowing in the dark anymore. And uh, lots of people like to go see it. Honestly, if I could dive, that sounds really cool. Mutsu, on the other hand, has mostly been raised from the ocean, at least the majority of her pieces, and now has a memorial museum. And uh, every year in June... On the anniversary of her exploding, a uh, ceremony is held to honor those who died. So there you have it. Very impressive battleships that essentially did nothing. But oh well. And next time, we'll get back to Musashi. Any questions or comments, please post them. As always, I appreciate you tuning in. This is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.